This is Devin with Writing Daily, where we talk about the writing life, how you do it more, how you do it better, how you find your way in the world and publish, bur- publish books and do all kinds of things that are fun with your living as a writer, whether it's a hobbyist or whether you are a pro, we kind of cover it all. Uh, As many of you know, my name is Devin Galladay, and I am the uh, editor-in-chief of In the No Traveler, as well as the author of 10,000 Miles with My Dead Father's Ashes, which is coming out soon. As always, if you like what we're doing, please consider hitting the like button or the wow button, or subscribe to us on YouTube or iTunes or one of the many places where we appear. And today I have a very special guest. I'm probably going to butcher his name, but I'm going to try to do it anyway. Uh, So today I'm with Bill Giovanazzo. How did I do, Bill? Perfect. Perfect. Wow. Wow. I was really (laughs) sweating that one out. Um, as, as Bill probably can attest, I personally have an unusually uh, pronounced and spelled name. And so it's, sometimes it gets to be a little bit of a crapshoot. So it was really important for me to get this right. Bill, it's so wonderful to have you here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, writing, about being Italian and Italian culture and Italian-American culture, because uh, you've written a book about it called Italian... Ita. Italianita, yes. Italianita. So Ital- uh, say, that, say that one more time. Italianita. Italianita. Okay, so here is a short bio on you, because we're going to talk about your book and a whole bunch of other things. But William Giovanazzo. Got it. Perfect. Is, is an author and international lecturer international lecturer who has written on subjects as far ranging as data science to Dante Alighieri, Bill's fourth book, Italianita, The Essence of Being Italian and Italian American, compares and contrasts the many facets of Italian and Italian American culture, providing an answer to the question of what it truly means to be Italian. He provides an insightful and entertaining look at the wonderful, life-affirming, vibrant Italian and Italian-American culture, as well as the historical forces that shape them. Uh, Again, Bill, it's really wonderful to have you here. Uh, I'm already fascinated. I'm already fascinated. Yeah. um, You know, I have been to Italy. Uh I have Italian-American friends. Uh-huh. Um, I have had the pleasure of strolling through the piazzas across Italy. Mm-hmm. I have had uh, pizza in little <laughs> shops throughout Venice, and um, I have been I have been blessed with the ability to explore a little bit of Italian uh, and Italian American culture without actually having any Italian blood in me whatsoever. So I consider myself. Uh, grateful and an outsider. Well, well, well. First of all, benvenuto. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> welcome. I mean, that that's that's wonderful to hear. And 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 I'm sure I speak for Italians and Italian Americans everywhere. When folks who love our culture, who are who enjoy our culture, yes, we're as Italians are. We're more warm and welcome to embrace all of you folks out there who aren't Italian, but we'll adopt you anyways if you love our culture. Well, so you obviously love your culture, both sort of like from the motherland as well as yeah. here in the States. Uh, c- can I ask sort of like, A, what the book is about, and B, was there sort of like a driving force um, or something in particular that was like, okay, I need to sit down and write an entire book on the subject? Yeah, actually, you know, Devin, you and I have a lot in common because I think our books are, are driven by our travels and the the, um, our travels evoked a passion in us. And for me, it happened to be um, about my uh, ethnic or my cultural heritage. Uh, you know, I, I tell a story in the book about how the, the first time I saw the movie The Godfather, I was just a kid. And, uh, and I loved the scene where, where uh, Michael is in Sicily and, and he marries Apollonia, who I was just enamored with as a, as a, as a boy in early adolescence, it didn't take long for me to be very enamored with Apollonia. She was a beautiful, 
Mediterranean woman. And um, I fell in love with Italy. The thing is, though, I, for years and years and years, I always talked about Italy. I loved Italy. I wanted to go to Italy. I, I just had this passion to go to Italy, but I never went. And, uh, and I would always talk about it. I always talked about it with friends and family and all that. And I have this great nephew, and we, we were having dinner with my nephew one night. And my nephew went, for Christ's sakes, just go, will you? I'm tired of hearing you talk about going. Just go. So we went. And uh, when I got there, I discovered that Italy and Italians in Italy are very different than the culture from which I, in which I grew up. Uh, we're, it's, a, it's a culture that the, the two cultures evolved independently, mainly after World War II. And so there were distinct differences, and, but it's all still part of being Italian. And the passion I feel for not only my Italian culture, but my Italian American culture is, is something that I wanted to share with people for the richness of it, the vibrancy of it. Uh, I talk about it being life affirming. Italian culture is very, you know, you, you, you have the image of the Italian, you know, the, the big bear hug Italian and, you know, benvenuto, e hey, paisan kind of thing. But it, it's deeper than that. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of embracing all of life. And I wanted to explore that and I wanted to explore the differences between um, how those things express themselves in Italy and in the United States. So it became a passion of my life to discover more and more about my culture. And I wanted to share that with my Italian American uh, friends. What had happened was I discovered that a lot of us have what, what's called an invented tradition. Uh, we, during um, our, the evolution of our culture, uh, we kind of lost what was true Italian. We kind of lost what our grandparents had brought over in the early 1900s. And I wanted to remind us of those things that are truly Italian, as well as explore how we evolved and, and how our cultures evolved different. So it was that trip that really sparked things in then subsequent trips to Italy, where I was able to really explore not only the well-traveled tourist areas of Italy, but also to go into some of the back areas of Italy. I, I tra I've traveled through Italy on, on a bicycle, which I strongly recommend to people because you can get out into the back roads and into areas that you, you wouldn't see on a, on a tour bus. So it, it's a wonderful thing like that. For example, um, one time my wife and I were cycling and we were in between lakes. We were going to the various lakes in Italy. And I believe we were on our way to Lake Garda. I, I think that was the lake. But as we were going there, we were, we were cycling through a vineyard. And I mean, how romantic can that be to be? On a bicycle, on a sunny Sunday Italian afternoon, riding through, um, through vineyards. I mean, how great is that to begin with? But as we were traveling, um, we, uh, we came across a uh, monastery. And the road leading up to, that mon to the monastery had on its side, now for those of you who aren't Catholic, Catholics have a thing called the Stations of the Cross. And it's, it's, um, there are 13 points uh, from the time Jesus is arrested to the time when he, when he finally gives up the ghost on the cross, when he finally says, you know, into, my hand, into your hands I commend my spirit. So there's 13 Stations of the Cross. On the way to this monastery, they had these huge bronze reliefs, maybe I would say 10 foot tall by six, seven foot wide of the Stations of the Cross uh, on the, uh, leading up to the, the, the monastery, along the drive up to the monastery. And, and in between these, these huge bronze reliefs were these beautiful cypress trees. Now that's something you don't get on a tour. You couldn't get that on a tour because the road leading up to that monastery barely fit our bicycles, much less a tour bus. So when you can get to these foreign countries, when you can travel and see some of the little byways and highways, it's just a, it's just a wonderful, inspiring thing. So it was things like that that inspired me to write the book. And what you're saying is sort of certainly like what's inspiring me to read the book. And I right. think... I think what you're describing is kind of like what it means to be a traveler. 
you know, yes. um, as somebody who's really made a life out of traveling, I think, I think it's important to go see, uh, you know, the museums, you yes. know, like, how do you, how do you, how do you not go to Vatican city and spend some time in, in the Sistine chapel? You just, you sort yes. of have to, right. Yes. And then you also have to somehow get off the beaten path, even if it's just a little bit off of, you know what I mean? Walking through a neighborhood and going to a local store and making yourself sort of like an impromptu picnic and exploring something that most travelers are not going to hit on a tour bus for the exact reasons that you described. Exactly. Um, so once you kind of knew you had to write this book, uh, how did you go about doing that? Well, the first thing was, I, you, they say write what you know. So the, the aspect of my Italian-American culture, I knew and, and I had a good handle on that as well as my travels in Italy. But I didn't have a good handle on the history of Italy. I didn't have a good handle on some of the details about the language and things like that. So this book is actually a, a work that's taken me uh, almost every night and weekend for the past five years. Mm. And for the first, I would say, three years, it was just pure research. Uh, reading, investigating, learning, um, learning the language, uh, reading uh, all sorts of books, everything from detailed histories of Italy to, uh, to just, you know, fun literature, uh, just some of the literature that people are reading, like... Um, like Umberto Eco, uh, some people may be familiar with um, In the Name of the Rose, but he's also written several other books. F um, Foucault's Pendulum comes to mind. There you go, excellent, bravo, bravo. Yes, there's, there's so, many, so many great works of Italian literature. So I spent a lot of time researching and a lot of time writing and rewriting and reading and rewriting and changing and modifying. Um, one thing that I caution people about when they write is understand writing is really hard work. I mean, as you know, right, I don't have to tell you. Writing is really hard work. It's um, if you're a social person or you want to be around people, um, it's, it's tough to be a writer. I mean, it's, it's great to have social input and be able to have those experiences. But a lot of writing is just yourself in a room. Uh, I, I tell people I must have read this book at least two dozen times out loud to myself. And um, so a lot of time reading and writing and reworking it, um, structuring sentences, you know, where, where do I put the comma? Where do I, how, where do I, does the phrase go at the beginning or the end of this sentence? And then um, after a couple of years of writing, I sent it off to my publisher who said, no, you know what, we really have to restructure it. So that was another year of writing and rewriting and rereading and restructuring and shifting things around. But there, I'm not sure. I, I, I wish I could remember the name of the author who said, I, I hate writing, but I love having written. And um, I, I wouldn't say I hate writing, but writing is really hard work. But once you've written something, um, there's such a joy to having written something well, to go back and reread it. Um, my wife knows better than to read anything I write until it's published because otherwise there's going to be 14 drafts before it actually gets into print. So she's just now reading it. And uh, she was reading it the other day. And I said, well, where are you? She goes, well, I'm at the beginning of chapter three. It's like, oh, 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 chapter three, paragraphs two and three. Those are my favorite paragraphs. Here, let me read them to you. And so I grabbed the book from her and I started reading them to her because I, I just so loved um, I get carried away with my own eloquence, let me put it that way. So I, so I love rereading uh, the final work to friends and things, especially certain parts. So, so those of you who, um, who buy the book, which I hope all of your audience does, definitely uh, the beginning of chapter three is one of the things where I wax most eloquent. So, yeah. I, I definitely identify with that. I mean, on a personal level, I've just had uh, my book show up at my door a few days ago, and I've got some uh, some literary readings coming up. And so I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm going through, I'm going through sort of like, well, what's the stuff I want to present to a live audience? What is it, you know, and then of course you have to read it over and over and over again. So you can kind of present it as seamless as possible. Um, and I think it's a wonderful, exciting thing. And by the way, 
Uh, if you are watching right now, this is a wonderful time to click the like or the wow button because that's kind of one of those things that let, lets us know that we're on the right track. But to get back to you, Bill, uh, one of the things that you talked about, which is almost a little bit curious to me when I read it, is that you're looking to help Italian Americans move back to reclaiming their culture. What, yes. is that, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, see, this is what's great. Uh, the, the, this is what's interesting, fascinating to me, is that when Italian, American, when Italian immigrants first came over, they call it, I call it the diaspora. Uh, there, there's been various diasporas in, in history. But we first came over the majority between 1890 and 1920. And we really retained our culture. There, was, there were Italian schools, there, were, there, was, there, were, there was Italian theater. Um, we really, the little Italy's cropped up where we really retained a lot of our culture. And then World War II came along. And there was a real suppression of Italian culture. Uh, for one thing, the Italian government as you'll see, the Germans and Japanese uh, Americans send their children to, to schools on the weekends to learn the language. Italians did during, prior to World War II, and they were partially sponsored by the Italian government. Uh, when World War II broke out, they stopped that. And, uh, they, and they put up banners in, in saying, don't speak the language of the enemy. And they really suppressed the idea of mm. speaking Italian. In fact, it's kind of interesting to me because um, uh, there's, a, there's a meme that goes around social media and it, it shows a bunch of children holding American flags. They're obviously immigrant children. Uh, I'm speculating that the photo was probably taken on Ellis Island sometime during that. So you can imagine in your mind's eye, uh, homespun cloth, you know, folks, little kids in these, you know, ragged homespun clothing, wearing, waving these little Italian flag, American flags. And the caption to the meme says, when Italians first came over here, we learned English, uh, we, um, we waved only American flags, and, uh, and we became citizens. And that's about as untrue as it possibly could be. Um, we, didn't learn, we didn't learn English. Uh, most of the Italian Americans I know I've asked them this, and I can, and I've supported it with actual statistics. Uh, say that they couldn't speak with their grandparents because their grandparents only spoke Italian. My grandmother, I never had a conversation with her. She only spoke Italian. Um, mm. Both my grandmothers, in fact. Uh, and if you look at the statistics from that period, only five percent of Italian women, uh, and I think it was less than ten percent of Italian men, really spoke English. They spoke a, a pidgin form of, of language that was half Italian, half, well, half Italian dialect and half uh, American. So we didn't learn English. We didn't, we didn't become citizens. Actually, Italian Americans were, of all the immigrants coming to the United States, least likely to become citizens. And yeah, we, wo we, wo we, waved, Italian, we waved American flags, but we also waved um, uh, Italian flags. And in fact, uh, when Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, uh, the federal government put a boycott on copper to Italy. Italian Americans uh, started sending little copper postcards to Italy to circumvent the, the boycott. And tons of copper made it from the United States to Italy because there were Italian Americans supporting the Italian government. So, mm. so this concept of Italian immigrants being these uber patriots um, is incorrect. Now, don't get me wrong that Italian Americans, when they came to this country, we, we love America. We think of you know, the dream of the United States. I, I, on my blog, um, I, have a, a, um, I just recently posted something about being Italian American. And I'm, I'm very proud of my American heritage, as well as many uh, Italian Americans. And I feel very patriotic towards my country. However, we weren't these uber patriots that people want to reinvent. But this all occurred during World War II when they really, first of all, they suppressed us when we came over here. They didn't like the way we ate. They didn't feel that, um, that children should have the same kind of diet as their parents. They didn't feel that, they felt that children should be drinking milk. Um, the funny thing about that is I remember as a child being four or five years old, 
And in the morning when we had breakfast, I tell this to people, they, they can't believe it. But in the morning when we had breakfast, we didn't have milk in our cereal. My mother would buy these big bags of puffed rice or puffed wheat, and we would use black coffee. So I would have a bowl of black coffee with this, this, these things swimming around in it. And that was our breakfast. And it was, were, were you hopped up? And is, that's not an Italian thing, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really was. It was from the old country. But then, yeah, men, many uh, Italian-Americans I knew growing up. Yeah, we, when I was a kid, we didn't, we, it, yeah, we drank milk. I hated milk as a kid. I just hated milk. The nuns would make us, and I loved the Catholic Church. It's wonderful and stuff. But nuns did to us, did to kids some of the things they shouldn't have done. One of the worst was um, drinking milk. They were these little glass milk bottles that were supposed to look like, they were miniatures of large milk bottles. And they would serve it midway through the morning. It was always this lukewarm milk that was just, ugh. And I didn't like milk to begin with, but then we had to like drink our milk. But that isn't how it was at home. I, I drank coffee in the morning. I, actually, my beverages were pretty much the way they are now. I drank coffee in the morning when we had beer. I had, when we had pizza, I drank beer. And uh, it wasn't uncommon for me to have a glass of wine every now and then as a kid. But um, it was common. I mean, we, and we weren't drinkers. I mean, growing up, I, I, I've never been the guy that was like a heavy drinker because it was just common. There was nothing to it. Now in Italy, they still do that. But they suppress that in the, in the Italian-American culture. Our eating habits, they suppress. They suppress our language. And they really tried to make us into what my Italian, my Sicilian, my sainted Sicilian mother used to call a Madagans. So they would try to make us into a Madagans. Um, good, good old fashioned Americans who would drink milk and eat oatmeal for breakfast, something I still can't stand. But um, so they suppressed all of that. And in that, and they did a very good job of it because I think a lot of Italian Americans lost that touch with the traditions and the, and the ways we did things. Um, and so now you have many Italian Americans who eat casseroles and serve their kids milk and worse all eat pineapple pizza. You, you should not be allowed to eat pineapple pizza if you're Italian American. I, I, I don't think you should have pineapple pizza if you're alive. I, that God makes, bless you. God that, bless that you. That makes, uh, yeah, no, I have, a, <laughs> I have an emotional guttural response to that. Yes. Uh, so but, what, but what do you think, what do you think in terms of the reclaiming, what, I mean, do we now, uh, do I go to my Italian friends and say, hey, dude, no, no milk in your cocoa puffs. I think you got to start putting in black coffee. What, 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 is the, what is the thing? Like, how would you envision it uh, uh, reclaiming? What would that look like? That's a great question. And that's, and that's um, the, the concluding chapter of my book. I, I strongly encourage Italian Americans to, to learn about their culture. And, and we can do it in sim the simplest of ways, especially nowadays with the internet. Um, so there's things like learning our music. I mean, I love opera. I love Italian opera. Um, and when I can see it in the theater where it's subtitled, it's wonderful. I bring my Swedish wife and she, she can also enjoy the opera as well. But and you don't have to start with an opera. Listen to a few arias. There's some wonderful arias. Um, uh, um, Uno Bambino Caro. It's, it's a beautiful song about a woman who's in love with this man and the father won't let her marry him. And it's wonderful. Um, there's Una, um, uh, oh gosh, the name escapes me. Uh, forgive me. But there's dozens of wonderful pieces of Italian music that you can listen to and just enjoy. Um, if you could learn the language, uh, learn the language. Uh, Rosetta Stone, I strongly recommend. Um, just there's various things that you could just learn the language. Learn pieces. You don't even have to become fluent. If you can become fluent, God bless you. That's great. If uh, you want to listen to an entire opera, great. But just start getting a taste for some of these things. Um, learn the difference between Italian and it Italian American food. And I strongly recommend uh, to people, especially Italian Americans, if you can get to Italy, get to Italy. Now, not everybody has the resources or the time to get to Italy, but if you could get to Italy, get to Italy. 
And one thing I strongly, strongly recommend is um, I love seeing Italy on a bike. Uh, I've done a couple of bike trips to Italy and I strongly recommend it to people. Uh, there's a couple of very good tour groups. Um, can I mention their names? Um, yeah, sure, fire away. Okay, there's one group that I, that I especially love. It's called Experience Plus. You can find them on, on the internet. But they do a wonderful job, and even the most inexperienced cyclists um, can get on a bike. They have things at various levels, various levels of difficulty. But, and they have a lot of good tours through Italy. Um, whether it's with Experience Plus or another group, go to Italy. If you could do it on a bike, even better yet, because you can get into those corners of Italy. If you can't do it on a bike, if, well, for whatever reason, go to Rome for a week. And, and the amazing thing is, English is, is spoken by a lot of people in Italy. Uh, in fact, to get a college degree, you have to take several English courses to graduate in Italy. So many people speak English. It's very easy to get around in Italy. Um, so go to Italy, uh, experience the, the culture in Italy. Um, but just do, the th do things that, that are part of our culture. So the literature, uh, we were talking about Umberto Eco. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, we were talking about, um, there's other people. There's, there's um, oh, of course, there's Dante. Uh, the Dante is a bit challenging, though, because it was written in Old Italian, and there's a lot of symbolism, um, which actually is uh, going to be the subject of one of my next books, is that what I want, I want to do is put an annotation together of, of Dante so that people could truly appreciate the beauty of Dante's work so that they can go through and, and learn things about this literature. Um, but there's, a, there's tons of really good Italian literature around. Um, and, and, if, and if all of those are a little bit cerebral, highbrow kinds of things, Italian film. Um, there's wonderful films that will that'll just touch your heart. Cinema Paradiso, um, uh, The Postman, Il Postino, uh, Life is Beautiful. Uh, there's tons of wonderful films. Uh, there's a wonderful film called Melina, starring uh, one of the most beautiful Italian women I know, um, Monica Bellucci. Um, but she's in this movie, Melina, who, that's a wonderful film. So there's, there's tons of good, good films out there. You know, Literally, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on one key thing. What's that? I'm going to say that going to Italy even if it's a little expensive, is not that expensive. Because, I mean, there's ways that, you know, you can take out a credit card and get, you know, 50 or 60,000 frequent flyer miles. And you pretty much, I mean, quite literally, I have personally flown from Los Angeles into Rome for $70. But that's, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just put frequent flyer miles on it. And then I actually, personally, I have a friend who's in Rome. And even if I didn't, uh, there is uh, all kinds of opportunities now to stay in, uh, you know, in sort of like home homestay types of environments yeah, yeah. where you get to sort of like have firsthand experiences. And I will say, um, you know, when I stayed, the last time I stayed in Rome, and I've been there, I've had the good fortune to stay there multiple times. But when I stayed there last, I had a friend who's not even Italian. She married an Italian. She's been living there for 35 years. Uh, we stayed in her home. We hopped on, on buses and she walked us around. I mean, we didn't do anything special. We went into a couple of markets. We got a baguette. We had a lunch in a piazza. We did all those kinds of things. And it was a remarkable way to see the country because you are meeting people on public transit. You yes. are having lunch where, where locals are having lunch. And I think, uh, and, and certainly staying with, with somebody. So as an example, when I last went to Italy, we spent almost nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I have the, I have the perks of, of certainly understanding the tourism industry, but I would say that if you want to go, go. Like you just figure it out. And if it costs you an extra few bucks for plane tickets or, you know, a hotel stay, you can do those things. But there's lots of ways around those things to just make it happen. I, I concede the point. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you could, do, you could go to Italy very inexpensively, and it is very inexpensive. Uh, the food there is, 
I found the food to be very inexpensive. You could have a wonderful meal for, for not that much money. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I can see the point. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, definitely if you're Italian American, you gotta, you gotta make it back to Italy because it's just, once you go, you won't stop. I mean, I, I did the one trip in 2004 and I keep going back. And the worst thing is when I see pictures of, of Italy, it's like, Oh man, I just got to get back there. I just got to, once you go, you become addicted. You'll love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's it, it's a, a, a remarkable destination. You know, it's sort of funny is because I've interviewed at one time or another, pretty much every tourism board, you know, national tourism board around the world at one time or another. And, you know, there are very few countries, many countries are always fighting for tourism dollars in one form or another, because tourism is an important industry. But when you talk to like, somebody with the, you know, the Italy tourism board, they're sort of like, you know, when it's like, well, why should somebody go? They're like almost indignant. They're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's Italy. You, what are you, what are you insane? You know? Yeah. So, so I know not to ask that kind of question because it is, I mean, really when you're talking about world destinations of places that have culture and history and great yes. food without question and romantic settings and beautiful people and fantastic fountains and orders to make wishes in Italy is certainly one of those places. Um, yes. So in terms of just kind of to move away from Italy a second, you know, in terms of your own writing, have you, have you mostly focused on kind of cultural things or what, what other sort of, you know, components have interested you as a writer? As a writer, um, I first started writing about technology. So I've, my first three books were on technology and my profession. Um, but since then, I've been also writing about literature and, uh, and I'm doing, I'm now starting to venture into fiction. I'm working on some pieces of fiction right now. But, uh, you know, I, I write about what I'm interested in, uh, the things that, that fascinate me, because then, and in fact, one of the things I like to do is write about something I don't know about. So a lot of, some of my technology books were things that, uh, and some of my technology blogs, in fact, uh, are things that I'm not necessarily an expert on, but it's a great way to become an expert to, to write on something, because then you're researching it, you're discovering it, and uh, it, it helps along those lines. Um, so in the past, it's been a lot of uh, technology and professional stuff, but moving forward, I see myself moving more towards uh, writing about my culture, Italian history. But as I said, I want, in addition to the fiction that I'm going to be writing, I'm also very interested in, uh, in helping to make Dante available to the masses. Mm. I, I believe that Dante's and let, let me re, let me make this more strong. I was going to say I believe, or uh, let me say the greatest work of Western literature is the Divine Comedy. Mm. Uh, and people will challenge me. They go, well, "What about Shakespeare?" Look, I love Shakespeare. If you ever saw Spinal Tap, where the the amp goes up to eleven, I'm not sure if a lot of people relate to the reference. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So to me, Shakespeare's ten. Okay. The Divine Comedy in Dante is eleven. I mean, Shakespeare is awesome. I love Shakespeare. I quote Shakespeare. I read Shakespeare. I study Shakespeare. Uh, my daughter and I have a Shakespeare night once a month where she comes over and we'll watch a Shakespearean play on video. But Dante, uh, Dante is just, it's, it's one epic work. And my, one of my daughters asked me, she says, well, what is it? Is it, is it history? Is it theology? Is it poetry? Is it is it romantic? You know, yes, it's all of those things. And if you really want to understand Renaissance Italy or Italy on the cusp of the Renaissance, Dante's it. Um, Dante, when, if you want to understand love, Dante's it. If you want to understand uh, theology, Christian theology, Dante's it. I mean, and if you just want the sheer beauty of the language, Dante. I mean, it's just incredible. One of my favorite lines from Dante is, um, Considerate, considerate la vostra semenza, fatti non foste vivere come frutti, ma per sanguire virtù e conscienza. And what that means is, be, consider your children. You are not meant to live as beasts, but to seek truth and wisdom. And that, um, I think, 
encapsulates so much. And I think it also encapsulates the Italian culture. Uh, the, the Italian culture is very focused on, on our art, on, on who we are as a people in capturing that art, and Dante does, does that so well. So when we talk about what I'm going to write, uh, so those are some of the things I, I want to write more uh, fictionalized histories of Italy, as well as making uh, Dante more uh, accessible to the masses. That, that sounds fantastic. And, and I think I see behind you, uh, cleverly folded out, is your latest book, uh, oh, Italianita. <laughs> you know, listen, I totally get that. We got we to gotta go work it out. You know what I mean? There you go, buddy. That's what you got to do. So that said, can you take a cover and sort of like put it out in front of the camera? So I sure can, because I happen to have a copy right here. <laughs> wow, that was like almost a magic trick how you did that. <laughs> yeah, isn't it amazing? <laughs> I just happen to have a copy, Devin. So wow, what, what were the odds of that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so yeah, Italianita, mm -hmm. the essence of being Italian and Italian-American. And, uh, and when you read the book, you'll find out what it really means to be Italian. I think I capture that pretty well. And so where, where can people find it? Is it, is it easy to get? Uh, you can either go to my publisher's site, Ben and, and Kearney. Um, and let me excuse the glasses, but it's uh, uh, www.bennionkearney, K-E-A-R-N-Y.com. -E -E you can find it on that site, but then you can also, it's also available on Amazon. It'll start shipping on the 17th, so hurry and get your copy now before they, they sold, sell out. But you can, you can order it on, on Amazon right now. Uh, just look for Italianita or uh, or my name, William Giovanazzo. And so, uh, matter of fact, I'm going to spell your name. So, because... <laughs> you can't get it just by saying it? <laughs> what, what What are the odds? Okay, so uh, so that is uh, William Giovanazzo. That is G-I-O-V-I-N-A-Z-Z-O. Joven, or pardon me. Yeah, Giovanazzo. Um, Perfect. So it's uh, available on Amazon. It's available through your publisher. I'm going to give that email or that web address again, which is www.b as in boy, e n n i o n k e a r n y dot com. And the name of the book is Italianita. Um, you know, I think. Are there any any last thoughts on sort of writing and? And Italy, I know that's a lot to ask, but, uh, oh, and by the way, do you, are you doing any sort of uh, uh, public appearances or any, any things like that that are coming up in the- We period? haven't, we don't have anything scheduled as of yet. Okay, all right, well- But then I know you, but hey, let me, let me help you out here. I know you have one coming up. What is that, the 22nd in September? Uh, I've got actually a number of dates. I am, uh, the 22nd of September, I'm going to be uh, Long Beach at Gatsby Books. And we're gonna be talking about 10,000 miles with my dead father's ashes. And I'm gonna do a little bit of reading. And I have a couple of really wonderful readers that are gonna be there as well. Uh, Tony Ann Johnson, who uh, uh, Remedy for a Broken Angel, as well as Seth Fisher, who is, who's, I think he's won every award in North America and is incredibly talented as well. Uh, and fortunately they will help bolster me up. Uh, but so, so that all said, uh, if you are out there and you are interested on a fantastic book on culture and, you know, being Italian or living Italian or learning more about the Italian experience, uh, check out Bill Giovanazzo's book, Italianita. Again, Joe, thank you so, so much for being, or pardon me, thank you so much, Bill, for being it here. It happens all the time. <laughs> I, I bet it does. I bet it does. But, you know, and this is Derwin Galander signing off with, uh, <laughs> with Writing Daily. Yes, so this is Devin Galladay with Writing Daily. Thank you so, so much for being here again, as always. Thank you. you know, thank questions you. and comments, you know, like us and fill in those boxes. And I'll make sure that Bill gets back in touch with you if you have questions about his work or anything else. Otherwise, go check out his book, Italianita. And uh, that's what we've got for today. And I hope you are going to be with us again real soon for Writing Daily. Thanks, Devin. <laughs>